Did the PS5 Pro just leak? We have a new spiritual successor to Until Dawn coming really soon. Gran Turismo 7 is definitely going through some issues. And Sony has bought yet another big studio to make exclusive PlayStation games. Things are really looking up in the world of PlayStation news. Out of all the amazing exclusives to come out during the PS4 generation, one that really stuck out to me and I feel like kind of flies under the radar just a little bit is Until Dawn. It was a game that was originally announced as a PS3 move title and then it kind of went dormant and came back as a PS4 exclusive that was sold for around 40 or $50. So it wasn't even a full priced game, but what it was, was absolutely awesome. And I never understood why Sony didn't push it harder. Basically the concept has been done a lot since it came out, but it was new at the time. You got to play a horror movie and based on the decisions you made, any of the characters in the horror movie could live or die. And it was cool because even if you killed off the majority of the main characters early on in the game, the story still felt really cool because there's nothing better than a bunch of teens you don't really like dying in a horror movie. And there were actually some actors in this game that you would know from TV and movies like Rami Malek, Hayden Pantier, and then the guy who played Agent Grant Ward in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I don't remember his name right now, but he was really good in the game as well. And while it's definitely showing its age in 2022, it still looks really good and at the time it did give me that uncanny valley feeling. It's one of the best games to come to the PS4 and if you haven't played it, you should definitely check it out because a spiritual sequel is coming on June 10th. 10th. Yes, this is coming very soon. It's called The Quarry, and this one is right up my alley. It's basically going to be a mix between Evil Dead, Friday the 13th, and The Thing. The only movie franchise that's missing from that is Halloween, but I will give them that mulligan because holy this sounds awesome. The concept for this is very similar to Until Dawn, but just a lot bigger. They're taking a summer camp slasher and mixing it with a creature feature, kind of like what they did with House of Ashes and the Dark Pictures anthology, and I'm glad they made those Dark Pictures games because those those kind of seem like they're walking so this game can run. As for why this is coming out so soon or how they even got it made while they were working on the Dark Pictures anthology, this was actually supposed to be a Stadia exclusive and when Stadia kind of imploded, Supermassive was able to take it to 2K Games who picked it up and got it over the finish line. And man, the cast for this one is even better than Until Dawn's, especially if you're an 80s horror fan like me. Not only do we have David Arquette from Scream and Eight-Legged Freaks, we've got Lin Shay from Insidious, Lance Henriksen who's basically a legend character actor from the 80s. You probably know him from Alien. Justice Smith from Detective Pikachu and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And my favorite on this list, or actually tied with first place with David Arquette, is Ted Raimi. He's Sam Raimi's brother. You know, the guy who directed Evil Dead and Spider-Man. He's a great actor in his own right, and I feel like he's gonna fit in perfectly in this playable horror movie. Something that's really interesting to me is how the story is set up. They basically explained it as the core mystery is the middle of a wheel and all of the different characters in the playable movie are all heading towards the same middle point. So they're like spokes in the wheel. So if one of them dies off or seven out of eight of them die off or eight of them die off, it doesn't really hurt the story in the long run. And if you manage to kill everyone off, the game is still going to take around seven hours to beat. So if you are just an absolutely sadistic player or your knowledge of 80s horror just isn't extensive enough to keep these people alive, you should have a good time playing through it. But yeah, like I mentioned, this comes out June 10th. I will be playing it on my PS5 and I cannot wait. And if you want some tips in future videos on how to survive a playable slasher movie, make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications set to all. I'm really working hard to get to 100,000 subscribers, so it'd be awesome if you could help me reach that goal. All right, so Gran Turismo 7's been out for a couple of weeks now, and across the board, the reviews were absolutely incredible, which wasn't really surprising to me just because, you know, it's Gran Turismo. It only comes out once or twice a generation, and racing fans seem to put it on an extremely high pedestal, so I was glad to see that people were enjoying it for the most part. But then I heard about this live service business because man, it seems like Sony completely missed the mark on what people want out of a live service Gran Turismo game. First of all, the biggest issue people have is that this is an always online game. Even if you're playing in single player mode, you can only do an extremely limited amount of things in the game if you're not connected to the internet. We can go back and forth all day long about whether or not always online games are good or bad. Gran Turismo 7 seems to be ruffling some feathers just because it's the seventh game in the franchise and nothing it's really doing seems to justify that always online requirement. It seems like a lot of the stuff that requires the internet connection could be done offline and Sony is just choosing not to, to stop piracy or people from cheating their way to get better cars. I don't really know what the benefit for them is to keep it online only. Things really came to a head over last weekend though when they put out a patch for the game that completely broke the online services for over 24 hours. And because this game is always online and it's so limited when it's offline, people really couldn't even play the game. 
game. And then when they finally fixed it, the patch that they used to fix it completely changed the payout system for some of the races in the game. So some races got their payouts increased by quite a lot, but more races that people were using to grind up credits to buy new cars had their payouts drastically reduced. And that issue in itself was compounding on another issue, which was that in Gran Turismo Sport, a lot of the same races had much higher payouts. And on top of that, the same cars you could get in Gran Turismo Sport that are also in GT7 cost a lot more credits in GT7 than they did in Sport, but you can just pay for some credits yourself and buy them early. The director of the game made a statement about this where he basically tried to talk his way around it and say, oh, I wanted to convey the value of these cars in real life. But the whole reason you're playing a racing simulator like Gran Turismo 7 is so you can have fun driving cars you can't afford. And I know why they have these microtransactions that are insanely expensive in there is because of the mass appeal of Gran Turismo. You know, this is a game that everyone plays. This is a total dad game that totally transcends the gamer uh, core group of people who buy every game that comes out. There are people who will go buy a PlayStation 5 and only buy Gran Turismo 7, and those are the people who are gonna drop a ton of cash on the game to get more cars, because you know, it's the only game they're really playing and they wanna get those cars earlier, so they're gonna spend the money. That's just how it works. I'm actually kind of surprised at how hard Sony is unwilling to budge on this issue. They're basically saying, well, if you wanna get these cars for free, you can just grind out races in the game. But you know, it's crazy that they're changing the payouts of credits in races and making them less than before. And it seems like the races that they're changing this on to make them pay out less are actually the short races you can grind over and over again to build up credits. The ones that are paying out even more credits now are the ones that are gonna take you a really long time. So if you do the math, you're gonna spend more time in the long run on those longer races. We're gonna talk about this more in a minute because Sony just bought another studio to make a live service multiplayer game, but they are really going all in on this stuff. And when you see what's happening with Gran Turismo 7, that kind of makes me happy that they bought Bungie to help them out with the live service stuff. Because say what you will about Destiny, Bungie has figured out how to extract value out of the game versus just overcharging you for skins and stuff like that. So hopefully the people at Polyphony Digital can go talk to the people at Bungie and figure out how to get the pricing scheme and the fun factor of Gran Turismo 7 back in check because this always online stuff is really fun when it works, but when it doesn't, you really notice that it's not working and they gotta figure this out fast. Speaking of Bungie though, back when Sony picked that studio up, they said they were far from done buying new studios and they proved themselves right today when they purchased Haven Studios. If you guys don't remember, this was a studio that was announced in the middle of last year. It's the new studio from Jade Raymond, the person behind Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs. And then after that, not really a whole lot. She started a few games. She hasn't really finished a bunch, but Haven was her new project that Sony jumped on board with super early. Now their first game was announced as sort of like a multiplayer online live service type deal with no real details attached to it just yet, but it makes sense that Sony wanted to see what they were doing before picking up the entire studio. But obviously, if Sony is purchasing the whole studio just under a year later, they're seeing something that's worth purchasing in this game, which is kind of crazy because they already had it as an exclusive. I'm just gonna be real, it's kind of hard to get super excited about this this early in the game. They haven't even said what the game is they're working on, really. They just said it's going to be a multiplayer game. We don't know if there's an IP tied to it. We don't know if it's going to be a completely new thing. And like I've mentioned, after Watch Dogs, Jade Raymond hasn't really done a whole lot of note. A lot of games have been started under her leadership and just completely left unfinished multiple times at this point. So I kind of feel like we just got to wait and see if this game even materializes. But it is a good sign that Sony saw something in it to the point where they wanted to buy the studio. And hey, even if she leaves this project behind like she did her last couple, the studio will still be there and they'll be able to pick up support from all the other amazing Sony studios like Naughty Dog. So we just had that news story where Sony was shipping development kits from London all the way to Oakland, California, and everyone was kind of assuming those were for the PS5 Pro or the PSVR 2. Either way, new hardware is new hardware, but now we have a more concrete rumor that we have the PS5 Pro to look forward to maybe a lot sooner than we thought. According to the leaker RGT, the plan right now is to make this new PS5 available by the end of 2023, maybe sometime in 2024. It is two times the standard graphics performance, 2.5 times in ray tracing over the vanilla 
version, and it's being designed to provide a better experience overall with the PSVR 2. It's also allegedly going to incorporate some form of AMD super resolution, but it's going to be assisted by Sony, which is actually interesting because we just saw a patent filed by Mark Cerny to have some sort of upscaling in future iterations of the PS5. And if you don't know what super resolution is, it's basically AMD's answer to Nvidia's DLSS, where the game is actually running maybe at like 540p, and then it uses an AI algorithm to upscale the graphics so it looks like native resolution. It's a really good way to make games look like they're running in 4K, but you'll get insanely good frame rates out of it. The best example of a game I can think of recently that benefited from DLSS and FSR is Red Dead Redemption 2 on PC. That game runs so much better when you're using DLSS. And ironically, the same thing goes for a recent PlayStation exclusive, Deathloop. That game runs so much better when you're using FSR or DLSS. On the PC side, it's kind of like a mixed issue because while the technology is good, a lot of developers lately have been using it as a crutch to release games that don't run that well. And then they just say, oh, if it's not running well, try using DLSS. And it's like, well, if I'm running on a PC with a 3080, the newest generation i7 and 32 gigabytes of RAM, maybe your game should be fixed up a little bit more before you release it, you know? On the console side though, I could definitely see this being useful. I just wish it would come to the PS5 as well. I don't know if you need a whole new graphics card to include this technology or if it's going to be included on both the PS5 and the PS5 Pro, that would definitely be the ideal scenario. And the reason I think this technology would work out so good on console is because of all these games we're seeing that basically have to run at 30 frames per second to use ray tracing. There is the odd game that'll include ray tracing and run at an acceptable resolution and run at 60 frames per second, but those are definitely few and far between. I mean, look at a game like Ghostwire Tokyo. That game has six different performance modes that are all all based around V-Sync, resolution, frame rate, all of them trying to hit 60 frames per second. But there's not really even a mode that uses ray tracing that runs at a higher resolution. And even on PC, like I mentioned, I have a 3080 in my PC. It is very hard to run games at a higher resolution, like 1440p and have ray tracing on and get 60 frames per second. Honestly, without DLSS, it's pretty much impossible for my computer across the board. So when you look at a console, which is selling for like half the price of all those parts combined, having ray tracing at all is definitely like a feat but being able to do it at 60 frames per second, I would probably just switch to console pretty much across the board, man. Like that'd be crazy. I could definitely see some PC people just throwing in the towel and switching back to console across the board because it's so hard to get a PC these days that runs with ray tracing at high frame rates. The only thing that's really bumming me out here is how soon this is all happening. The PS5 itself is still pretty unavailable across the board. Even when Sony does restock it, scalpers just buy it up super quick and I can see the frustration people are having with just throwing in the towel and having to pay like six, seven hundred dollars for this console that can cost as low as four hundred. It's really getting frustrating out there. And Sony turning around and saying, well, we know that you can't get a PS5, so we're about to make it that much harder by splitting the factories and making some of them produce PS5 Pros and reintroducing those into the market and then splitting the user base across graphical fidelity because, you know, by the end of the PS4 generation, you basically needed a PS4 Pro to even get 30 frames per second. It's just not really a good scenario when you can't even get the base console that everyone wants. 2024 still feels a little early to me, but I feel like that's approaching acceptable. And 2025 though kind of just seems crazy. Like I can't even think that far into the future. So maybe even that is a little too late. With everything going on right now with these chip shortages and all that, I definitely feel for the people making these consoles because it's getting really tough to compete for all these different parts, but they're gonna have to figure something out at the very least to get these consoles out of scalpers hands and into gamers hands because releasing a new console when people who want the old ones still can't get it just doesn't seem like the best business move to me. But hey, what do I know?